Hi there, everyone. Uh, welcome to tonight's online information session for the proposed development at 1530 Reservoir Road. Uh, we're going to get started shortly. And just a reminder that the session will be recorded. Uh, it's 630 now, so we'll just give folks a, a couple more minutes to uh, join us. Looks like a uh, few people are still trickling in, but I think we can go ahead and get started. Uh, so welcome again for those that have just joined. Uh, this is tonight's online information session for the proposed development at 1530 Reservoir Road. Uh, friendly reminder that the session is being recorded and we are ready to get started. So tonight's meeting is taking place on the traditional and unceded territories of the Silk Okanagan Nation. We extend our appreciation to the Silk Okanagan people for the opportunity to hold this meeting here today. My name is Andrea Rendell, Communications and Engagement Specialist with the City. And joining me tonight are Joanne Klebb, Communications and Engagement Manager, and Senior Planner Stephen Collier. The purpose of tonight's information session is to ensure you are aware and understand the proposal, provide you with opportunities to learn more and ask questions, and we want to include your feedback for the applicant, staff, and council. A reminder that our focus tonight is on the question of whether or not the community supports the site-specific OCP amendment related to the proposal for the new subdivision on the subject property. So first of all, just another reminder that this uh, session is being recorded and that's so that we can accurately capture the feedback we receive in our discussion portion. Uh, we'll go over a brief presentation and open the floor to hear your questions at the end. So we're gonna ask that you use the Q&A feature uh, to ask your questions and address the group. And uh, to, if you can, please remember to keep your questions as concise as possible so that we can get to everybody. Uh, and with that, I'll hand it over to Stephen for his presentation. Great. Thanks, Andrea. Uh, the city's received this application proposing a single detached strata subdivision on the subject property. 33 lots are proposed along private strata roads to be built through the site. The proposed lots range in size from 0.4 hectares to 3.7 hectares and would be rezoned to RC country residential. The section of the lot shown in green on the slide here would be rezoned to P4 environmental reserve zone with five hectares of that area to be dedicated to the city as natural parkland. Several planning applications are required to facilitate this proposed development. The application package considers the OCP amendment to add a site-specific policy for this property within the rural residential OCP designation to allow a minimum lot size of 0.4 hectares when connected to the domestic treated water supply instead of the one hectare size envisioned by the OCP. And the zoning amendment bylaw is considered as well to change the, the zoning from the current FG forestry and grazing to RC country residential with the site specific provision to allow four and a half meter front yard setbacks rather than the standard nine meters for that zone, with the remainder portion of the property being rezoned to P4 environmental reserve. Future applications would be considered uh, by staff, and that would be the subdivision itself, which is considered by the approving officer. And conditions of that subdivision approval would be the hillside development permit, which is a council decision to approve the grading and development layout in this hillside environment, and an environmental development permit to approve the subdivision within the environmental assessment area, which is outlined by the OCP. This property is 31.5 hectares in size, and it's located on the south side of Res Reservoir Road, just above Naramata Road. The property does not contain any structures and is currently uh, surrounded by agricultural and rural residential uses on three sides, with the Campbell Mountain protected area upslope to the east. This property is not within the ALR, 
and is bisected by an electrical line and a gas line running through the property north-south along protected rights of way. This next slide shows some of the planning history on this site. In 2002, the OCP designated 1530 Reservoir Road and the surrounding area as a future planning area. In 2005, the citywide comprehensive development plan envisioned up to 350 units in this area of the city, and the more area-specific Northeast Sector Plan saw up to 400 units here. The planning work was formalized in the 2014 Spiller Road Reservoir Road Neighborhood Concept Plan, which envisioned a village center on the property, featuring a commercial node and median density development, such as townhomes and apartments. In the 2019 OCP, the city's growth plan had a strong shift away from new urban neighborhoods on hillsides and shifting towards infilling and intensifying the built up area of the city. So the property was redesignated for lower density rural residential development by the current OCP rather than the higher density, more urban style development envisioned in the past plans completed between 2002 and 2019. In terms of financial implications for this development, the developer would be responsible for all required infrastructure upgrades and installation for the new development, including the infrastructure within the proposed strata. The city would be responsible for long-term maintenance of the extended water main infrastructure along Reservoir Road after it's installed at the developer's expense the strata would be responsible to maintain private infrastructure within the site. The application package was reviewed by the city's technical planning committee, and that's an internal group of city staff who review all development proposals received by the city. The staff group reviewed the technical reports and subdivision requirements and provided feedback to the applicant at an early stage. The proposed park plan was agreed to remain largely in a natural state with some reconfigured hiking and biking trails to connect to the larger Campbell Mountain Trail Network. The servicing requirements were relayed to the applicant, including the need to extend the water main from Naramata Road up about 200 meters to res along Reservoir Road to allow the development to connect to the municipal water system. The applicant is aware of this requirement and that the expense is on the developer to install that infrastructure. This next slide shows the water main extension that would be required up to 200 meters in length, depending on the final subdivision layout and servicing requirements. The current water main ends just up from Naramata Road to the west of this site. One of the technical reviews completed was the environmental assessment report. Prepared by a qualified environmental professional, the report identifies a range of sensitive areas on the site, with the north and west sides being less sensitive than the east and south sides of the site. The development has been clustered to provide natural parkland in a large section of higher sensitivity area. There were no areas of the property in the highest sensitivity category, according to the report. Prior to the subdivision of the property, an environmental development permit would be required and may set requirements under which the development must proceed to ensure it's aligned with the report conclusions and recommendations. In addition to the environmental assessment report, the applicant has submitted a wildfire hazard assessment report, geotechnical assessment report, stormwater management plan memo, and a cultural heritage resource assessment completed in collaboration with the Penticton Indian Band. The reports may need to be updated or additional details provided at the future subdivision stage if the requested land use is ultimately approved by council. This slide summarizes some of staff's analysis of the application package. The OCP amendment and rezoning are considered to have merit for consideration given that the OCP envisioned development in this designation to be fully on private services necessitating larger lot size to accommodate both well and septic systems. With this proposal, the applicant would extend municipal treated water to the site, eliminating the need for private wells and is intending septic systems, but may look at options to extend the municipal sewer main to the site as noted in the developer's letter of intent. Staff note that the RC zone being requested for the majority of the site is the only corresponding zone with the rural residential OCP designation, according to the land use designations table that you see in the excerpt on this slide. The RC zone allows a minimum lot size of 0.4 hectares, which is complied with based on the proposed subdivision plan submitted. This slide shows some of the applicable OCP policies related to this development. The proposed rural residential subdivision is adjacent to existing rural subdivisions, including Hillside Drive at a similar scale. The applicant has completed technical assessments to help inform the developable and non-developable areas of the site. The proposed parkland dedication would provide hiking and biking trails integrated with the larger Camel Mountain Network, and that land would be uh, remaining in its natural state, a large portion dedicated to the city, 
and then all of that area to be zoned environmental reserve. Part of the rezoning proposal is a request to reduce the minimum front yard setback in the RC zone on this site from nine meters to four and a half meters. As you see on this image, the intent of the reduced setbacks to the strata roads is to cluster development closer together to keep the disturbed area of the site smaller. In this hillside environment, having the flexibility to go to a reduced front yard setback where needed can help avoid extensive regrading as well. Applying this setback at a subdivision wide scale sets a common standard within the development and means individual front yard setback variances would not be required as long as the buildings meet that four and a half meter setback. The OCP amendment and rezoning are the first steps in development occurring on this property. If those are ultimately adopted by council, a subdivision application would be required along with final technical reports for environmental impact, wildfire hazard, geotechnical hazard, and a site creating plan stormwater management plan. The environmental development permit and hillside development permit will be required prior to the subdivision being registered. As for next steps, the city's collecting feedback on this proposal until September 3rd, and staff will present the results of the engagement to council right before the public hearing, which is scheduled for September 12th. The public hearing will be the opportunity for the public to share their feedback on this proposal directly with council before further consideration of this application package. I'll turn it back to Andrea. So that's the proposal. Um, thank you, Stephen. Now we'd like to hear from you. Um, if you'd like to ask a question and address the group, uh, please put it uh, in the Q and A uh, feature. Or um, if you're, if you'd like, you can raise your hand, and we'll try to get to it uh, that way as well. You also have the options. Um, if you'd like to just send Stephen your questions in an email, you can. Uh, you can send those to Stephen Collier at penticton.ca, and he'll do his best to respond within two business days. And with that, we can open the floor for questions. Um, I see Rebecca has one right away. Um, for the new development to make sense, the benefits it provides should exceed the drawbacks. Given the nature of summer fire season in the Okanagan, which is only going to get worse with climate change, building new homes in the interface seems foolish in the extreme. How have the fire protection costs been included in the city's evaluation of the proposal? Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, this development is within the wildfire interface and we have a mapped layer at the city showing those areas. So as a requirement before subdivision, uh, we have the developer contact the professional forester who goes out to the site, provides an assessment and recommendations for how to develop with reducing the wildfire hazard risk as much as possible. Uh, and one of the features of that, which we can carry through the subdivision is requiring fire smart construction and fire smart development on every lot in the subdivision. So that would look like the wildfire hazard report being attached to a covenant that goes on title, which would restrict the building materials on those lots and also set landscaping requirements on those lots to be followed as the new development uh, continues on really in perpetuity. And the advantage of doing it as a covenant is that future owners would be aware of those risks and those requirements as well. Um, and this is kind of in the similar vein from Goya. Uh, what did the wildfire hazard report say about this land and forest? Yeah, the report acknowledged that there is certainly a risk here. The report does need to be updated with this current development concept, uh, just ensuring that the professionals reviewed the subdivision as currently proposed. And like I mentioned in the presentation, that would be absolutely required before subdivision approval by the city. Um, but the idea with the wildfire report is that it sets out requirements for treatment of the site on a site-specific basis, so based on the features of the site itself to reduce fire risk. And then, like I said earlier, can also uh, set mandates, requirements on individual lots to be created within that area to be followed in perpetuity. Great, thanks. The next question is from Lori Goldman, and she's wondering how this development fits with the climate emergency and climate action plan. Yeah, I mean, look at that plan. It definitely encourages uh, features of infill development, and our OCP in general encourages that style of development. Um, in the last few years, we've seen about 400 new units get built in Penticton every year. And the majority, the vast majority of those are happening within the built up core of the city. Now saying that the current OCP still has areas that are designated for new hillside developments. Um, so 
this is one at a very low density uh, scale with it being rural residential, but there's a few other areas of the city that are still designated for this type of development. But in terms of the number of lots, it's definitely far less than what we're seeing already happening within the core and intensification there. So while this application is for 33 properties, we've seen, like I mentioned, about 400 new units being added in the core part of the city every year in the last few years. Wow, awesome. Um, Peter Rutherford is curious if a traffic study was done considering peak traffic on Naramata Road. Yeah, good question. Traffic is definitely an item that's come up quite a bit through this engagement period. A um, lot of comments on Naramata Road specifically and with all the development happening kind of along that road as well as the events, the wineries, the tourist, um, tourist season. It's definitely uh, something that's top of people's minds. With this development at 33 lots, it didn't trigger a traffic impact assessment on its own. While saying that, there are some abilities that the city has to require minor intersection updates at Reservoir Road, Naramata Road intersection, because right now it's just sort of a vast expanse of concrete. So there's ways that we can maybe delineate that a little bit better. Uh, but in terms of Naramata Road overall, and really the route from Naramata all the way into Penticton, that was assessed as part of the city's 2020 transportation master plan. And as part of that plan, it set out different projects to look at over time to help alleviate those concerns. Because a lot of those concerns exist today. And yes, this development will add some traffic to that, um, that corridor. However, if the issue is existing today, it's really on the city to look at at a more comprehensive level than um, situating the entire fix with one development. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question is from Bridget. It's similar to the one uh, that was answered just previously about um, how it fits into the city's climate action plan, given we're in a climate crisis and BC is on fire. I, Stephen, do you want to elaborate on what you've just said or? Yeah, like I, I will say, I think that's something that's important for council and for the community to consider with this proposal. Like the OCP was completed in 2019 and the climate action plan was completed two years later. So uh, ensuring that our OCP is still in line with the direction that we want to go with, with the community climate action plan. Uh, and there's a lot of elements to that plan as well. Um, it really speaks to new construction, meeting um, really high efficiency standards. Um, retrofitting existing buildings to make them more energy efficient is a really big part of that as well. And encouraging alternate modes of transportation, things like biking, walking, cycling. So um, evaluating how that fits with um, or this proposal with the Climate Action Plan, I think is something that's really important for the community and council to consider going forward. Excellent. Um, so we have a question from Peter. And then after that, I see Susan uh, has her hand raised. So we'll go through Peter's question and then we'll come to Susan. So Peter's question is, uh, considering the lots will be on septic, did the environmental study consider potential leakage into adjacent property owners? Yeah, that wasn't part of the review at this stage because the servicing solution hasn't been finalized. Uh, they did design the lots large enough to accommodate septic systems in case the sanitary sewer main extension is uh, not the final option. They have that as the servicing solution, septics on each lot. Um, septic system approval is done by Interior Health, and I know that there's a range of different systems that can be um, installed, engineered, and prepared. So essentially, it would have to meet those Interior Health requirements, which apply to every new septic system that's installed in our region uh, before being installed and going forward. So uh, that's the that's the answer. We don't have the servicing solution set yet. Although they have left room for septics, they are looking to still explore having the sanitary sewer main extended to the site as well. Okay, thanks. And now, uh, Susan, if you're ready to ask your question, we're ready to hear it. Um, I went through all the, the um submissions and I can't see anything so that this development wants to connect to the city of Penticton's water supply do we're fortunate in the city we have hardly well I don't remember ever having a water boil advisory unless there was like a major something majorly broke but I know everywhere around us has this all the time like are there is can our system handle this development especially if 
they're going to plant grass and trees and whatever else they're going to plant that requires watering. I mean, have we looked into the landscaping? Does it, is it exteriscape? Is there no grass? Is there like, can, can our water system handle this? Great yeah, question. thanks, Susan, for that question. Yeah, so this is one of the reasons why all development proposals get reviewed at the technical level by staff first. So our engineering team takes a look at all these proposals before they go to council or the community, just to see, you know, from a technical standpoint, is the servicing viable or or what requirements are there to bring servicing to the site? So this was looked at. There's definitely capacity with our water system overall. I mean, we're projecting quite a bit of growth growing into the future and our water infrastructure and our water treatment plant was developed with that in mind. Uh, the water main doesn't currently run in front of this site. So that would have to be extended uh, as per the slides about 200 meters from Naramata Road up to the site. And that would be at the developer's expense, but it would be city infrastructure within Reservoir Road that the city would maintain in perpetuity. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, the next question is from Bridget, and I think this is a good question because I was kind of curious myself. Uh, where is the tra KVR trail in relation to this proposal? Yeah, I don't have a really zoomed out map in this presentation, but the KVR trail is a little ways away from this uh, subject property. Um, it's probably a couple kilometers away. The closest access point is uh, further up Naramata Road towards Hillside Winery and the pump track. Um, and then it kind of loops back around Munson Mountain. So it doesn't run too close to this property. Great. Um, our next question is from Brian, and he's wondering uh, what changes will be required for the Naramata Road intersection? The requirements we're looking at is uh, delineating turning lanes and just providing stop bars and things like that at the intersection. Right now, it's just kind of open, and some people who are making a turn might have to wait for someone else who's turning the other way because um, it's just sort of a wide open piece of concrete. So looking at things like that, um, no major upgrades proposed, at least as a direct result of this development. But like I mentioned, the city's transportation master plan evaluated the whole Naramata Road corridor and identified some future projects. I don't know exactly the details of what that could look like or the timing of those, but I do know that a citywide study was completed on the corridor as a whole. And uh, another question from Lori. Uh, if the development is supported, what does the future uh, look like for more city sprawl, risk of traffic issues for evacuation, and danger of future growth that increases emissions? Tough question, yeah. Lori. <laughs> Looking at our OCP designations now, there's very few areas of new hillside developments identified by the OCP future land use designations. So this reservoir road property is one site. Um, the spiller road development on the other side of the landfill is another site that's currently designated that way. Um, and the Wiltsey development, which went through council last year. Um, those are sort of the three biggest hillside developments areas designated by the OCP today. So we are undergoing as a city, the OCP housing review, and that is looking at policies overall citywide with housing need and where do we want to grow and do the areas that we have designated today still make sense for the community's needs and what we want to see development look like and where where it goes so that process is underway now council set up a task force but there's also opportunities for public engagement later this fall and in the spring for the community to weigh in and provide their input on that kind of bigger citywide policy direction, like where do we want to go? Where do we want to see new homes built? Um, do the hillside areas that we have still make sense or should they be relooked at? It's quite a process to go through and we don't expect any changes from that process until the new year for sure um, to really give time to consider questions like that because it is a big direction shift for the city. Uh, we're looking at accommodating uh, a lot more population growth than the 2019 OCP anticipated. So we really want to do it the right way and uh, come up with the changes uh, 
wherever they are and whatever they look like to the OCP housing policies uh, in a collaborative manner, giving the public opportunities for that. So I'd say that to the kind of bigger scale piece, like looking beyond just this reservoir road development, like talking development in general, hillside development in general, I think there's good opportunities coming up to weigh in on that process. Excellent, thank you. Uh, our next question is from Nicole, and then I'm going to go to Lynn, who has uh, raised her hand. So um, Nicole's question here is, uh, they're curious which areas are environmentally sensitive. A lot of areas in the same elevation in the area are environmentally sensitive at that elevation due to ponderosa, blue bunch grass ecosystems, and these areas are not to be developed. So how is it possible to take it out of the grazing zoning designation at all? Yeah, this property is within the environmental assessment areas for the OCP. So that assessment was required and is a condition of subdivision, but we wanted to see it now before the land use question goes forward to council for a decision. Um, the environmental assessment was prepared by a registered biologist who did a complete assessment of the site and set out four different categories for environmental sensitivity. One is the highest, most sensitive that must be protected and two, three, four from there become less sensitive and kind of more disturbed historically. Uh, as you get to four, there's really not much environmental value. So those are areas that are you know already developed or disturbed in some way. Um, so the environmental assessment did not find any environmentally sensitive ESA one highest protected areas on the property. There was ESA two and three over a good chunk of the property. And like I mentioned in the slides, the higher um, sensitivity areas were on the east side and the south side, so east up towards Campbell and then south away from Reservoir Road. So that helped inform the subdivision layout and also the area that is proposed to be set aside as parkland and natural parkland, like uh, in, in an untouched state, aside from the rerouting of some trails to that area. So we rely on the experts to do that site analysis and with their professional expertise as registered biologists. Um, they're the ones that do the assessment and provide recommendations considering development going forward on the property. So that's what we asked of from the developer. And that information, like all the technical uh, reports, is available on Shape Your City for public review if you'd like to take a look. Great. Took the last bit right out of my mouth. <laughs> Everything is available on Shape Your City. Um, okay, Lynn, um, you should be able to ask your question now. Please go ahead. I, I put a bunch of uh, questions into the, the uh, Q&A, and I think I can ask them here. So uh, what control and regulations do the city uh, have over the building of the 200-meter water line um, as far as quality is concerned, uh, because, since we are going to be paying for the uh, maintenance as a city? Yeah, it's entirely within our discretion. It's our infrastructure. So we're actually the ones that install it. It's the developer that covers those costs of us installing infrastructure to our own standards. Thank you. Okay, um, right now I live on a bare, bare land strata and there is no regulations in the strata that protect the land or the biodiversity. For example, uh, a strata can use any pesticides they like on, on their lands. Uh, so what conditions can the city put in in order to uh, protect wildlife and, for example, also uh, protect trees? Yeah, we have a few tools. So zoning is the first one I'll start with. So rezoning that section of land to environmental reserve sends a strong signal that that can't be touched. That zone doesn't allow any structures to be built, for example, just for land to really remain in its natural state, for passive recreation, for trails, that sort of thing. So that's the first one. Um, we also have, through the environmental development permit, the ability to impose conditions on development as it gets built out. So as the work occurs, we can require the developer to submit a post-work report to basically ensure that a registered biologist has been on site throughout and is happy with where the development is going and that their recommendations have been followed throughout the development stage. So we can require that as well. 
And through the strata bylaws, I'm not exactly sure of what exactly can be allowed and not allowed through strata rules. I mean, that's a little bit outside my area of expertise, but I'm sure it'd be up to the strata if that is something that's really important to them to set bylaws and manage them themselves as a group um, to help maintain some of those things that the city just doesn't have the jurisdiction over um, beyond our zoning, beyond our environmental development permit requirements. Right. So I'm more concerned about we're coming forward, going forward, what is going to be happening to this land. Uh, if, if the city doesn't have control over um, what private landowners can do with it. So that's uh, that's a very big area not to have control over the trees and the and pesticides. And you're like you say, it's close to um, other other areas of um, uh, residential areas. And my third question is, um, has the Indian Band agreed to this land development plan? The Penticton Indian Band were involved with the Cultural Heritage Resource Assessment, the developer commission for this property. So they're aware of the proposal. They collaborated with that work of going on site and seeing if there is any architectural or archaeological rather um, values to the site. It's not a final report. There's still some more work to be done, but they have been involved with that work to date. And they're in agreement with it. I, I don't have a, a letter of approval or anything, but I can say they've been involved with that study. Thank so you very much. So they're working together. Then. Yeah. Thank you, Stephen. Okay. Thanks, Lynn. Okay, our next question is from Kathy, and their question is whether or not these new homes will be for permanent residents only, or is there vacation rental potential? Yeah, like most zones in Penticton, vacation rentals is a permitted use in the RC zone. So that could be an opportunity for the owners, unless the strata chose to further restrict that beyond city zoning. Okay. And the next question is from John, and he's curious uh, whether this application may be premature given the OCP task force is reviewing future land use designations in the Northeast sector. Yeah, I mean, applications come forward all the time for different developments on different properties. And because work is happening on the OCP, there hasn't been a moratorium set or anything like that on new applications coming forward. It's definitely still within council's discretion if they choose to delay a final decision on this proposal until that OCP work is completed. Uh, but at this stage, the only direction they've given is for staff to conduct these information sessions ahead of the public hearing. Thank you. Uh, next uh, is uh, an anonymous, more of a comment than a question, but just to note that they appreciate the opportunity for feedback and are aware that uh, we need more housing, but they're concerned about the impact um, on the only road for access um, in and out of Naramata Road. Um, traffic is already heavy and increasing, and the subdivision would bring more cars increasing traffic. More people um, would be in the area to evacuate in the event of an emergency, and more traffic would impact uh, the tourism gem that Narabada Bench is. Um, thank you very much for that comment. We've definitely made note of that. Um, our next question is from Susan, and they're wondering, can the City of Penticton's water supply handle this development? I think we went through this one. Um, I don't know, if uh, Stephen, if you have anything else to add. To yeah, that. I think we might have covered all three questions so. that Susan asked here, um, yeah. but happy to elaborate if I might have missed something or if there was more that you were curious about. Yeah, so if there's anything uh, extra, Susan, just toss it in our uh, Q&A here and we'll get to that. Um, next is from Rebecca, and they say it seems pretty clear this development will not help the housing crisis. We need more lower income housing. Um, this seems to be exclusive interface housing. So how can the city justify the costs associated with servicing this development when it won't solve any of the city's current problems? Yeah, good question, Rebecca. And housing need has come up quite a bit through this engagement, but also on almost every project that we've taken forward lately. I mean, it's definitely out there in the community. People are feeling the need for housing, um, affordable housing, attainable housing, all those pieces. Um, the city just completed a housing needs assessment in July of this year, and it set out the expected need for new homes up until 2046. And it's really across the whole spectrum. While there's demand for apartments, townhouses, there's also still demand for single detached homes and providing more units um, is necessary to meet the 
uh, household numbers that we're expecting with population growth over that time. So I think the question is a fair one to ask and one that I'm sure council will consider as well, um, looking at the cost of this development. I mean, the infrastructure costs are lessened on the city with it being a strata development versus a standard subdivision. So we're not maintaining the roads and infrastructure throughout the site as a city, that's all on the strata. So really the only piece that the city would be maintaining long-term is that water main extension. Um, but still a fair question to consider, you know, is that infrastructure extension, you know, considered appropriate to allow 33 homes to go forward and get built? I mean, that's one of the considerations for this proposal for sure. Awesome. Uh, the next question is from Bridget. I'm not sure if this is one you can answer, Stephen, but um, she's wondering, would the city and RDOS consider future, future transit service? Uh, I mean, perhaps. There, we're always in conversation with uh, DC. They just did their own uh, public engagement process not too long ago to see uh, where the needs are. And with new development, it's something that's on our radar as well. I know that there is the Naramata bus route that goes out that way. I just don't know where the closest bus stop is to this location, but I know that there is a service along Naramata Road. It gets tricky going up Reservoir Road and some of the other roads because they're dead ends and it's hard for buses to turn around. And of course, the density is lower in these areas than a lot of core parts of the city. So, I mean, that doesn't assist transit service too well either, but maybe there's opportunities with the current route that does go out to Naramata. Um, looking at options for a stop close to this development, perhaps if there isn't one already. Excellent. Um, Peter has another question here. It says, thanks for the traffic update and is just curious if uh, the city can provide the traffic plan um, and wonders, did the city consider uh, that the only one route of access egress to the site? Yeah, um, I think you're referring, Peter, to the traffic plan that looked at all of Naramata Road. So that's the transportation master plan. We might be able to drop a link in the chat or, or something to help you out, but it is available on our website um, that looks at that whole corridor as well as just transportation needs across the entire city. Um, and looking at this development with the one uh, route of access e egress, I mean, there's not much opportunity to provide additional road connections to this development. Reservoir Road is the only road frontage for this site. So there's not really viable second options uh, for this development um, because to the side um, going down slope is all ALR land and privately owned lands. So if the opportunities for connections were there, it's definitely something we would look at. But uh, going forward, it looks like Reservoir Road is the only viable access for the development. Great, thanks. Uh, your next question is from Joa. Sorry if I'm not saying that properly. <laughs> Um, they're wondering what precedents uh, this might be setting, allowing the OCP to change from its current zoning of 16 hectares to um, 0.4 hectares and the rest of the northeast sector along the Naramata bench. And they're wondering um, if the character of our countryside is being respected, given the OCP has one hectare minimum lot size for future land use in this area, why go smaller? Yeah, good question. Uh, each application is considered on its own merit, and this application proposes a site-specific policy change to the OCP. So just for this property to allow 0 0.4 hectares in the rural residential designation rather than the one hectare. And that's with the caveat that there's connections to the municipal water supply. I mean, this is the proposal that has come forward to the city. And part of the justification is that they're clustering the development to minimize environmental impact. Um, to support the smaller lot sizes, as well as not having to provide wells and septics. Um, so maybe being able to go to smaller lot sizes based on that, having partial services instead of fully private services. And I think that's something to consider. I mean, the one hectare rule um, is, is in the OCP. It's very clear. Uh, but this property itself is 31.5 hectares. So looking at it that way, I mean, if the entire site was developed as one hectare lots, we could be talking close to the number of lots proposed now without having that clustering component and potentially having less parkland and protected re environmental reserve land uh, as a result. So, I mean, that's something to consider. And part of the reason why we're going out and doing these information sessions is to kind of share the nuances of that request a little bit and share how it's kind of based on this proposal that has come forward specifically for this site. And in terms of precedence, I mean, each application has to be considered 
on its own and on its own merits and with its own plan. So I, I don't know if I can really speak to precedence, but we haven't seen an application like this for the rural residential designation since the OCP was adopted. Great. Uh, the next question, um, I think we've already answered this one. It was from Lynn, um, just kind of asking what control and regulations does the city maintain over the building of the 200 meter line? And that's that um, the city installs it to our standards, but the developer is the one who pays for that installation. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Perfect. Um, the next one from Lori uh, just notes that uh, fossil fuel infrastructure in homes for heating and hot water uh, will not allow Penticton to reach the mandated goal of emission reductions by 2030 and 2050. Um, and we can't reduce emissions when we increase emissions. So will these homes be mandated uh, zero carbon step code? Uh, we don't have that requirement in place at the city currently, but I think there are conversations of looking at that step code requirement uh, overall. So instead of pegging it with one development, we'd be looking at it citywide. And I think that there's conversations happening now looking into that. Great. And um, another question from Peter uh, is curious what the required setbacks are from adjacent properties. Yeah, so I'll refer to those in the proposed country residential zoning. So the rear yard setback would be the one adjacent to the lower agricultural properties to the west of this site. And that would be a minimum six meter or 20 foot building setback from the proposed lots to that shared property line. Great. Uh, and the next uh, is from William, just noting that um, there was a public survey regarding 1050 Spiller Road that the majority of those respondents um, expressed concern with uh, what was happening to the natural beauty on the hillsides uh, in Penticton with these kinds of developments. And he's wondering what impact will these um, developments have on the aesthetic and on the decision to either approve or disapprove developments on the hillsides of Penticton. Yeah, I know through that Spiller Road proposal, there were a lot of concerns with the visual impact. And we heard a lot of comments at that time about the Vista development in Naramata as well, because that's quite visual from a lot of areas around, uh, around our region. So it's something that we have taken into account when we're considering new development applications. We have a few tools like the applications that I mentioned, the, the zoning to try to cluster houses closer to the street. We have a hillside development permit, which can set requirements for grading, for tree protection, for tree replacement ratios, things like that, all in an attempt to reduce the visual impact that way. I know from them reading the developer's application package, they really considered visual impact when laying out the development and really trying to find ways to cluster things together to reduce the uh, need to regrade the lands, to, to strip things um, as much as possible. So I'm encouraged by that. And we do have some tools at future approval stages, like the hillside development permit, I think is a key one, where we can absolutely require certain things like that as the development builds out. Uh, but first the application uh, for land use change is what needs to be considered. So I think that's good feedback to share and good pieces to raise and something that is definitely on our radar with this development proposal and other development proposals in the hillsides as they go forward. The OCP has a hillside development permit area and pretty much all the developable areas on the hillsides in Penticton are within that hillside DP area. So we have some ability for developments uh, on the hillsides in those areas to uh, to mandate certain things like that. So I hope that answers your question. Well done. And um, just a quick comment from Lori, just noting that drought is a serious issue in North America and we are running out of water. Thank you, Lori. Uh, next question is from Susan. Just curious if the displacement of wildlife has been uh, considered. And a uh, final question uh, is whether will short-term rentals be allowed and how does this development fit in with our housing crisis? 
Yeah. So for the first part of that question with the wildlife, it was evaluated in the environmental assessment report. And again, that report is available publicly on Chipper City. Um, it evaluated the flora and the fauna. So the plant species that are on site, as well as the uh, animals and habitat areas that are on site or not on site as a QP found in many cases. Um, and then with the short-term rental pieces, um, it, it's a permitted use across a lot of Penticton and council considered potential changes to the short-term rental program uh, overall on the whole earlier this year and made the decision to, um, I guess, continue the course more or less with more of a focus on enforcement of unlicensed short-term rentals. So instead of looking at it as just this development and setting specific regulations for that, I can just comment from kind of the citywide perspective that 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 question was considered on a citywide basis, and that was the direction that council decided to go in. Great. And the next question is from Don, wondering uh, how many trees will be removed from the sensitive ecosystem? Yeah, we don't have an exact number of trees, but the hillside development permit um, outlines in the application requirements that a tree survey may be required. Um, like I mentioned with an earlier answer, I'm encouraged by the developer going about this process, trying to disturb the lands as little as possible. And also by that large uh, over five hectare area that would be dedicated to the city to manage as natural parkland. So the idea of that is that that whole area of the site remains in its largely natural state. Aside from, like I said, a couple trails being rerouted through that area. Um, there's trails through the site right now, but it's private property. So the thinking is rerouting those through a site that's owned by the city, uh, maybe a better outcome going forward should this development proposal proceed. Great, thank you. Um, and a question from Brian, would there be parking and public access to the park space? Good question. Yeah, good question, Brian. Um, there isn't plans currently for public parking and access to the uh, dedicated parkland. Uh, and the reason for that is that the parkland really connects into the larger Campbell Mountain network. Um, so the trail connections sort of lead to other entrances that are already available. Uh, I know of a couple along Reservoir Road, as, in addition to that big parking lot, just a little bit higher than the landfill which is a popular access point. And there's multiple other access points to Campbell as well. Uh, but the proposal that's before us doesn't propose um, like a public parking lot or anything to provide access in what would be dedicated lands to the city. And then uh, from Lynn again. Um, I think we might have answered Lynn's yeah. uh, with her, her spoken question, yeah. Yeah, okay, great. Um, so then moving on for Lori, um, will this development be approved before the new OCP is finalized? And if the OCP changes, can this development be reversed? So the timeline of this uh, application, it's going to go to Council for public hearing on September 12th. And then after the public hearing that evening, Council will consider their next decision with this application. Uh, so they may choose to proceed with it and approve it. They may choose to defer a decision given the OCP work that's ongoing, or they may choose to deny it. I mean, really the whole range of options is still available to them. So timeline wise, I'm not sure exactly when approval might come for this uh, proposal, like in your question. Um, but with the OCP process, we're looking at next year for sure in the spring before any uh, updates to the OCP uh, are in front of council because this OCP housing task force process and the public engagement process um, still have to be completed and still have to go underway. And there's still more work to do before we have specific recommendations to present to council to amend the OCP from the housing task force uh, piece overall. So that's kind of my comments on the timing for both this application and the OCP housing review. Great. And uh, next from John, just um, how does another car dependent subdivision encourage alternative forms of transportation? Yeah, I don't know if it aligns really with that that piece. I mean, this development would be separate from a lot of the city's uh, alternative transportation network. 
while there are connections to the trail network at Camel Mountain, I mean, there's road connections uh, into the city for sure. It's not too far into the downtown if you're traveling by bike, except you have to go up a really big hill uh, if you're coming home. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's that's an important consideration as well. Like I mentioned, we're seeing most of our new developments happening in the core already. This is one application for 33 lots that doesn't align with kind of the the general applications that we've seen lately for development, just in terms of location. Um, so yeah, I think it's an important point to raise and something to consider going forward. Great. Um, the next two questions are kind of in the same vein, one from Nicole and one from Lori, just asking who was the RP bio and who hired the registered biologist? Yeah, there are actually two registered biologists. So one completed a report a couple of years ago, and then another uh, registered biologist reviewed that report with the current development proposal and submitted um, sort of an addendum or an additional uh, information package uh, along with the original environmental assessment. Uh, and those um, professionals, like I, I say they're professionals, they have certifications, they have to adhere to certain standards. Um, they are consultants, so they were hired by the uh, landowner or the developer to complete those assessments ahead of submitting their application packages to the city. Okay. Uh, also, I, I don't, sorry, I don't have the names in front of me right now, but the reports are available on Shaper City Penticton, and it does list who the registered biologists were in those attachments. Perfect. Uh, next is from Susan, just a uh, comment that Wild Rock Environmental has suggested a more detailed assessment in their letter, and are those being considered? Yeah, like I mentioned in the presentation, there's still some pieces with the technical reports that will have to be updated, finalized, confirmed uh, before the subdivision gets approved. So as part of that environmental development permit is the time where we would push for any unresolved issues to be addressed to the satisfaction of the city. These are preliminary reports, so they provide a strong basis justification for the land use change. But before the subdivision piece gets registered, we really need to sort, sort out those detailed technical items. And that's the time for us to do it. Great. Uh, next is from Kathy, and they're curious, um, are these properties allowed to suite or carriage house as well? The proposed RC country residential zoning allows for a secondary suite or a carriage house in addition to the main house on the property. So that could mean a uh, possible two units on each lot. The zoning does not allow a secondary suite and a carriage house, just one or the other. Okay, and then from uh, Chandra, just curious how the proposal relates to the agricultural land reserve. Yeah, the ALR or the agricultural land reserve is right beside this property. It's on the properties to the west, but this property, 1530 Reservoir Road, is not within the ALR. Great. Um, next, uh, more of a comment from Chris, just uh, noting that um, if this proposal is approved, it's a slippery slope and um, hillsides are at risk for development, which it could effectively kill tourism. Um, tourists come here, not to look at housing, but to visit pristine wineries in a rural setting. And just a note why council uh, see and acknowledge that. So thank you, Chris, for those comments. Um, next is from Rebecca. On what basis did the city decide that more single family detached homes are needed? And what are the assumptions behind that conclusion? How were the many costs of fire infrastructure, traffic, ecosystem damage, et cetera, included in the evaluation of need? Yeah, those are really good questions. And I direct you to the housing needs assessment. It is available on our website. Like I said, it was just finalized in July, but we already have it up there. And one of the things they looked at is the household sizes and expected household growth. So it's true that families need more bedrooms and there is still demand um, for single detached homes, for sure. Um, whether all that demand gets met is another question. I mean, the housing needs assessment doesn't really guide us on exactly how to achieve the uh, projections that it includes, but it provides us a basis for doing work like the overall citywide OCP housing review, because it gives us a strong database to draw from. Okay. 
And that report's publicly available. Like I said, it's on the city website, the 2023 housing needs assessment for Penticton. Hmm. Yes, and uh, Joanne has made a comment in the chat just noting uh, there are seven technical reports posted on shapeyourcitypenticton.ca, including original environmental assessments and uh, the other reports that Stevens mentioned. So uh, please do check those out. Um, our next question is from Chandra again and uh, asking about how the forest interface is taken into, con uh, into account given the chances of wildfire and the need for escape routes if a fire were to take place in this area? Yeah, so like I mentioned, a wildfire hazard assessment report is required for this development to proceed. And we have an initial one that's available on Shaper City, but the purpose of requiring that report, it gives some guidance on on-site treatment that can be completed to reduce fire risk to the greatest degree, and also mandate things like building materials that should be avoided or should be required in some cases to reduce fire risk, as well as landscaping regulations to reduce wildfire impact. There's a lot of tools out there through FireSmart, and essentially what that wildfire report would do is mandate FireSmart development in this subdivision. And that would be attached on every lot's title to ensure that it's, it's on there, it's very clear. These are the requirements. They'd be reviewed at each building permit stage to ensure that they're adhered to, and they'd be on the lots forever. So it could always be referred to, and if the lots change hands, there's the ability for new owners to see that covenant, see that technical report, and understand the risks. Great, thanks. Um, so the next question is from Duncan, uh, does the city do a financial analysis to assess the benefit to the city and is it available for the public to view? Yeah, we don't do a financial analysis for every development. If a proposal is looking to change a future land use designation from one to another, and we have some concerns about, say, increased density, for example, out of that, that we could require that financial analysis. But given that this proposal doesn't proposed to change the rural residential designation other than to allow a 0 0.4 hectare lot size instead of one hectare. Uh, and given the number of lots and the number of units proposed, uh, it was determined that a full financial analysis was not required. Okay, and so we'll go, our next question will be from Nicole, and then we'll go to Kathy, who has her uh, hand raised. So Nicole is wondering, is the allocated donated area unbuildable anyway, and is that potentially too steep for animal traffic? Yeah, the area to be dedicated to the city as natural park land, it, it is quite steep. Um, it is still usable for trails, like I mentioned, we're, we're planning to have trails rooted through that area that are currently trespassing through the private property. Um, and in this case, I mean, parkland dedication, it can look different in different subdivisions. In some places, it makes sense to have a really nice flat playing field or playground, something like that. But in this case, just recognizing the site being right adjacent to Campbell Mountain, it seemed like an opportunity for the city to expand the protected area, where right now there's no um, publicly held lands on, on this site, there could be five hectares if the development were to go ahead. So that was considered an opportunity and looking at ways to possibly expand that network and the managed area of Campbell Mountain was seen as an advantage. So that's kind of some background on the dedicated land piece. Great. Uh, Kathy, it looks like you've lowered your hand. So if you have another question later, feel free to throw it back up there, but otherwise we'll carry on. Uh, the next question from Peter, given this uh, strata, does the strata council have the authority to overrule carriage house requirements, height restrictions, setbacks, et cetera? Yeah, I'll kind of tackle both of Peter's questions there. Um, the strata has ability to set bylaws and rules as they see fit and as they, as they choose as kind of a self-managing entity. So they would have opportunity to set further restrictions than the city zoning, for example. So even if the city zoning allows carriage houses on all properties zoned RC, perhaps the strata decides, no, we don't want to see carriage houses in this development um, or restrict them in some other way. And they have the ability to do that more so than a, a standard kind of fee simple, each lot on its own subdivision. So yes, they have abilities to do that and it's up to the strata to also enforce and maintain those rules. 
Me too. And then, yeah, just clarifying the, the next question, carriage houses are allowed by the zoning, um, but may be restricted by the strata. Okay. Um, and then a question from Don wondering whether the property owner is also on the OCP housing task force. I wouldn't know the answer to that. Yeah, I mean, the applicant for this proposal uh, does sit on the housing task force. And I think it's important too to reiterate that while there is a housing task force that is created by council, it's city council that's the final decision maker on any OCP amendments. And like I mentioned earlier, there's going to be uh, lots of opportunities for public engagement and feedback and input into any of the proposed OCP updates. Thanks. And uh, next is a comment from Lori, who's uh, seriously concerned about fossil gas emissions and pollution in a climate emergency. So, yes, thank you, Lori. Um, Rebecca also has a comment just noting that just because families want a single family detached home doesn't necessarily mean it makes sense to provide such homes, especially if they are placed in a high risk fire zone and in a location where car dependence is extreme. So thank you for that comment, Rebecca. And a question from Peter. Um, since secondary suites or carriage homes are allowed by the zoning, um, this could potentially double the traffic in and out of the site. And was this considered in the traffic report requirements? Yeah, it was considered by our engineering team when uh, all technical staff reviewed the application package, um, and it wasn't considered to have a major impact on those proposed modifications I spoke about to the Reservoir Road, Naramata Road intersection. I think the bigger work involved is looking at that whole Naramata Road corridor overall and everything happening on there, and it's not just housing developments, it's events, it's wineries, it's restaurants. I mean, there's there's just a lot happening. Uh, and it's all accessed off that road. So the cumulative impact is something that we looked at as part of the transportation master plan, that big citywide study. Great, and there is a link to that transportation uh, plan available in the chat for anyone who is curious about it. Uh, next question is from William, uh, just wondering whether the city is concerned about development proposals um, planned for uh, one of Canada's most sensitive biomes, the ponderosa pine grassland, uh, especially since there is so little of this biome left because of human encroachment and development. Yeah, I'd say it's definitely on the city's radar. I mean, the city made a really big shift in 2019 to scale back um, a lot of hillside development um, envisioned areas. The 2002 OCP was really aggressive on hillside development and designated so much land for that type of development that was really scaled back in 2019. But it, like I said, it still left some areas for potential development opportunities like this site. So it was considered as part of the 2019 OCP. Um, but still that OCP designated this property for some level of rural residential development looking into the future. Great. And um, Rebecca is wondering if the public can access the study uh, determining housing needs for the city of Penticton. The answer is yes. And there's even a link available in the chat to our 2023 housing needs assessment. Um, we're also having opportunities to get involved in the update um, the OCP in the coming weeks. So um, kind of a question from Lori. Um, it's a little bit long, so I'm just going to paraphrase here. Just concerned um, making sure that the houses are occupied and noting that it doesn't really address the affordability issue. Um, thank you for that. Just. Moving yeah, I, mean, I can I can comment on that a little bit. Um, you know, we're seeing a lot of development proposals across the city, and we've seen a lot of major projects come online in Penticton in the last number of years that all tried to work away at this affordable and attainable housing problem. I mean, there's certainly more work to do, and there's more need, and that's very clear through the housing needs assessment, the one that was just completed this year. Um, but I will say that this is private property and the application has come forward by a developer who believes that there's market demand for the project that they're bringing forward to council. And the city has some ability through zoning to regulate use, but we don't have the ability to regulate the people that 
go into these developments um, and how they choose to use their property. So I'll, I'll just mention that um, as well as the fact that there's a number of developments that are happening in the core that are addressing different areas of the housing spectrum as well. Okay, great. And moving along, we've got a question from Nicole. Um, just kind of has this uh, already been approved to be taken out of the forestry and grazing? What is it zoned at present? Yeah, good question. And this part is is always uh, a piece to explain. Uh, in, and I really, uh, I've explained this to a lot of people and I'm trying to make it as clear as possible uh, when I explain it to people. So there's the current zoning of the property, which is what you're allowed to do on it today, the permitted uses, the setbacks you can build to, and the current zoning on this property is forestry and grazing. The proposal is to rezone a portion of that to country residential and another portion of that to this environmental reserve zone. Uh, when I speak about rural residential and the official community plan, that's a little bit separate from zoning because the official community plan looks into the future and it sets designations on every property in the city of what types of development do we expect to see in the future? So maybe there's an area that's currently zoned for single family, but the OCP says, you know, maybe this is an area for townhouses in the future. And when we get rezoning applications, we look to see that the rezoning that they want aligns with the OCP designation that they have. So in this case, with 1530 Reservoir Road, the OCP designates it for rural residential. So even though it's zoned forestry and grazing today, the OCP says, you know, sub-level of rural residential development is a vision on this property in the future. And the OCP amendment being applied for is to say, well, the rural residential designation set a minimum one hectare lot size, but our proposal, we want to ask for a 0 0.4 hectare lot size instead. So hopefully that clears up some of the distinction. I, I really do try to explain that in the most clearest way possible, but some of this planning lingo is just, it's it's complicated and I understand that. And I know that there's questions about OCP versus zoning. Um, so if I could explain it better or explain it again, please let me know. Uh, but I hope that that kind of clears up the distinction between the future land use on this property being set aside for rural residential in the OCP versus the current zoning, which is forestry and grazing. Thank you. And then just a follow-up question from William about um, how the proposal does meet the housing needs assessment. Yeah, I mean, as you'll see in the report, there's an identified need for single detached homes uh, looking forward to 2046. And this proposal would provide single detached homes, uh, albeit 33 of them. The housing needs assessment um, states that there's a need for quite a bit more than that. But we know that Penticton has limited areas for new single detached homes to come online. Um, so I, I guess that's how it would align with the housing needs assessment report. So that report sets the projections and then it's up to the city and the OCP housing task force, official community plan housing task force to uh, determine, okay, if we need to provide this many houses, where are they going to go and what are they going to look like? And that's the work that's ongoing right now. And like I said, with the engagement opportunities available this fall and into the spring next year. Great. Um... Chris, I see you're wondering oh, OCP. I put it in the chat, but just in case uh, for anyone else, uh, OCP does refer to the official community plan. It's... And uh, next from Joa. Um, Residents of Penticton have been advocating that the Northeast sector be removed from the OCP growth plan. And they're wondering, will the OCP task force be reviewing this request? Um, as it was brought up repeatedly at Spiller Road engagement processes. And they're just wondering why are we going to involve the public process and then not do anything with the results from the public? Yeah, no, I think that that's a, a fair question and a fair statement there. Um, we are looking at ways to bring that information to the task force, just kind of working it into the plan that we have for the next couple of meetings. So hopefully we'll be able to share that with them soon and provide that information. Thank you. Um, next from a uh, question from Peter, just wondering where they can access the environmental reports and geotechnical reports. And again, those are all available on the shapeyourcitypenticton.ca uh, web, web page. Um, yeah, that's a good place to go. <laughs> I believe there's, uh, we said seven technical reports there. So 
yeah, a good place for all those. Um, next, um, Rebecca's not seeing anything in the housing needs report to say why there's a need for single family detached housing. Um, noting that just because a developer is able to sell properties uh, doesn't mean that these properties are needed. Yeah, maybe Rebecca, if you're comfortable, feel free to send me an email. Maybe Andrea, could we pull up my email again on the slide? Certainly. Um, if, if you want to connect about the details of the housing needs assessment, I think, uh, I, well, I'd be happy to have that conversation offline with you and, and kind of walk you through the process that was behind the housing needs assessment and what was involved with it. That's great. Um, I see a hand from John. John, if you're uh, ready, we are ready to hear your question. Hi there, can you hear me okay? You sound great. You sound great too. But Stephen, I know I know it's tricky explaining the, all the difference between um, all these different land use ideas, but can you just clarify what size the lots are zone four currently right now? Yeah, for sure. So the forestry and grazing zone on the property today uh, requires a minimum lot size of 16 hectares. 16 hectares. Yeah. And then, so this proposal brings it down to a one hectare? That's right. Or is it bringing it down to one acre? Oh, sorry. Yeah, one acre, 0 0.4 hectares. So we're skipping right over the one hectare size and we're going straight to a quarter of a hectare? That's part of the application, yes. Wow, okay, from 16 to one quarter. Have I got that right? From 16 to 0 0.4 hectares, yeah. Wow, okay, thanks for clarification. Great, thank you. Uh, next from Kathy, just noting that the future growth of Penticton is anticipated to be much larger in coming years than it is today. Um, has there been an assessment to determine if the current residents agree with this growth? Some of us have located to Penticton because of its smaller size. Yeah, that's kind of the opportunity that's coming up uh, in the fall and in the spring with public engagement opportunities on the OCP housing review. Um, definitely looking to to get everyone's feedback input on that. Different members of the public, different community groups are more than welcome welcome to participate in that process uh, when it launches. So that'll kind of open up the community conversation about how and where we grow. Excellent. And uh, the last question that I am seeing here is from Lori. Just wondering if maybe we can have a public presentation about the housing needs assessment. Yeah, um, I know it was presented to council at an open meeting. I don't know if maybe we can post somewhere a recording of that or if we find the right format or or time to present on that. There might be other opportunities. I don't know. Joanne, I see you maybe popping in if you had something to add there. Yeah, um, great question and great uh, setting up our next engagement process. So uh, <laughs> coming up in the next week or two, you'll see advertisements for uh, open houses in uh, neighborhoods across Penticton. And our plan there is it's part of the um, OCP task force on housing, but we will be um, going over what the housing needs assessment says to help uh, the community understand uh, some of the changes that you can anticipate. And um, I did want to ask Stephen a question myself, but somebody turned off my Q&A access. I don't know what that's all about. But <laughs> my question for Stephen is, I, um, what is what is the province doing around densification and adding housing? And do we know how what that means for Penticton? So we've heard a lot from the province lately about bringing in new zoning rules essentially across BC that would allow up to four units on single detached properties. Um, it's still unknown exactly what that looks like. We have no insight. We haven't heard anything from the province beyond um, what everyone else is able to see in the news articles and news releases, things like that. Um, so we're waiting for the fall when we expect that legislation to drop and see how it could impact our community. Um, we do know that they're looking at going as far as setting regulations 
for development of up to four units on single detached lots, they are looking at things like mandating setbacks, mandating parking requirements, mandating building heights. Um, and province wide, I just I don't know what that looks like just yet because so many communities in our province are are so different and their needs are different and there's unique character and all those considerations. So it's definitely something that we're interested in seeing once it drops from the province. And they've hinted at this fall. We don't know if it's September or October, um, but I'm sure that there will be lots and lots of discussions once they table the legislation that they're proposing with uh, adding more density into single detached areas province-wide. Excellent. Um... Here we go from uh, Chandra. She's um, just thinking about the recent wildfires in West Kelowna and just a comment that um, these properties likely had wildfire hazard assessments done, yet we know what happened uh, when the wildfire took place. So yes, those are heavy things to consider for sure. Yeah, um, and I'll note again that before the subdivision is registered and completed, uh, we'd be looking for uh, a refreshed or reviewed wildfire assessment report as well. And it would take into account the wildfire risk at this particular site, because I know that based on things like topography and forest mix and all these different factors that can really impact the risk levels. Mm -hmm. um, yes, and then just a question from Rebecca uh, for Stephen's email again. Um, if anyone does want to follow up, it's stephen.collier at penticton.ca. Uh, I'm not seeing any more questions. Um, if anyone like to raise their hand or take this opportunity to throw one in the Q&A. That's good. Okay, well, th uh, thank you, Chandra. <laughs> uh, question from John. How many developers or builders were handpicked to be on this housing task force and how many farmers are on the same housing task force? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's a question for city council. They're the group that selected the members of the OCP housing task force and the criteria that they considered when selecting those people is a question I think best directed to them. There you go. And I see a hand from Kathy. So, uh, Kathy, please go ahead. Hi, I just want to say thank you to both of you for um, hosting this Zoom session tonight. You've been awesome in answering questions in a timely and uh, very prompt manner. Thank you. Thanks, Kathy. Yeah, thank you. Okay, well, um, if there aren't any more questions, uh, I'd like to really um, thank everyone for coming and uh, just a reminder that um, if you haven't already done so, please complete a feedback form before engagement closes on September 3rd. And we thank you for attending this presentation and hope it helped you understand this proposal a little bit more. Thanks very much, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Have a good night.